Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Welcome everybody from all across Australasia. We've got over 100 attendees to this week's annual Vernon User Group Conference. So welcome to today's session where we're looking at the recent releases in Vernon CMS. We've been putting a lot of effort in the last year into our public YouTube channel. Our new release, which is Egret, will be coming out in November. And as we did last year with the Dusky Dolphin release, there will be an overview of that feature and that will be available as part of our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel has also become the place where we share the recordings of our monthly webinars. They cover various parts of the system, how to get the most out of it, and also we cover some more specialized topics. For example, how to make use of barcodes within Vernon CMS, or how to manage sensitive records and flag those and secure those appropriately within the system. So over the last year, the most recent minor release is 12.4.2, and that came out in November last year. That included numerous bug fixes, a couple of which I've noted here. So one of the bugs we had in the previous system was that if you weren't an administrator, you couldn't create a folder within the portfolio part of the Vernon CMS product. That's been fixed. And then we've also fixed an issue that affected the thumbnails for images not working if they included non-Latin characters. And that was becoming more of an issue as people use things like Maori Macron characters in file names. So that's now fully supported within Vernon. Another one of the changes that was in that minor release is a generic program for bulk updating related records to an activity. So I'll just swap to the, the new version and I'll show you a quick demo of how that change works. So for example, if you were working on the deaccession activity within the activities module, you might decide that once that activity has been approved, you want to bulk update the related objects with the correct deaccession information. So this is a, a deaccession proposal. We've got the details of one related object that related to that deaccession and other information about who proposed it and approved it. So I'm going to bulk update the related objects with the deaccessioning information. And that's gone through and it's updated that related record with all the deaccessioning detail. So if I go to that object record now, the object has a page which gives all of the information about the deaccessioning for that one specific catalog record. And that's now been copied from that record that we saw before. So the deaccession reason, the method, the author, etc. And so that's part of a new generic action in Vernon where you can take information from one activity record and duplicate it in the related records, typically in the objects that are related to that process. It might be acquisition information or deaccessioning detail. Most of the work, however, that we've been doing has been on the next major version. So that's Eager Egret. As part of that version, we're making use of the improved release notes process that we introduced last year. That means when you apply this new major version, each user will automatically be prompted when they log on for the first time to say that there is a new version and it will give them the option of opening up the release notes. So those release notes are part of the online help for Vernon CMS. And that button that each user gets the first time they log on automatically takes them to the correct page for the new version that's been applied to their system. The other area that we've done a lot of work on is in the person file and there's a number of changes there. We've added fields to record pronouns. We've added options for notes for gender and sexuality in notes. And then we've also moved all of the work and relationships information into the main page for the person file. We've also made it easier to report on maker information when you're reporting on the object file. 
So I'm going to run through a few quick examples of those. I'll open up an existing person record in the same development system. And I'll just open up my person record. So we can see here that I've got the option now of recording pronouns on my record. And we've got the new tab on tab three. So this used to be a separate window in the system, but we've moved it to the main page to make it more obvious which organization, for example, an individual works for. If I was wanting to report on an object that links to a maker, we've made that process more extensive. So I have one painting within my collection, which is called River Delta, and it's linked to this particular artist. We can already see in this field that the artist has a nationality of American, and we've got birth and death dates recorded. However, we may want to report on that information when we're doing an object cataloging report. If I go to the reporting screen, I've already pre-created a report, which I've just called Person Symbolics. And if I edit that report and look at the fields that I've included, this new version now includes a number of built-in links to specific fields that relate to the maker of each object. So any of these fields I can now report on directly from an object report. And so if I run that report, we now get whatever details I wanted from the object catalog record, plus those symbolic or calculated fields to show other information about the related maker. The next area that we've worked on in the eager eager version is XML import. So that's being increasingly used by our clients to both bulk update existing records and to create new records for the first time. We've added several new features into XML import to support that increasing use of this particular feature in the system. Firstly, we've added a new preview panel where you can see all of the fields that are being imported for the current records that the import is stuck on. So if there's anything that's part of the record you're importing that fails, it's now much easier to see the complete record and understand what is the information that hasn't been able to be imported into the system. One of the things which we check now are date pairs, like birth and death date or start and end date fields. The import now checks that the range of those two dates makes sense. And in this example that I've got on my screen, we can see that we've accidentally recorded a date of death, which is before the date of birth. So the import's telling us that that's invalid data, and it's easier to see now with this new panel what the information is that's incorrect and decide what you're going to do on it. I'll give you a quick demo of those XML import changes. So XML import is available through the XML, XML import screen. And I've got an existing import that I've set up called person records. That particular import is importing data from this spreadsheet I've created. So I've got four new person records I want to create, but some of those I've deliberately introduced problems which Vernon is gonna complain about as part of that XML import. For example, the category column, mailing list isn't a valid column in there. And then I've also got an example here where we've got those birth and death dates out of sequence. So let's say I want to run the import now. So this is that same data. And then as it finds those problems, I will be flagged. So it's flagging that date of birth must be earlier than date of death for that particular record. And then it shows us a preview of that record. And we can decide then what action we want to take. The actions that you can take have also been extended. So there's now options as to whether you want to skip this particular value on just this record, 
or skip it for all future records if it's a problem. And you've also got the option of skipping the whole record. So if you realize there's some problems with this record and it's going to just create a mess if you import it, you could choose now to skip the import of that record. We now see that second issue that I noted, that mailing list isn't a valid term. And again, it's showing me that preview, clearly noting which is the field that's the problem and with the context of the other data. So if you had to go back to the spreadsheet, it would be easier to identify which was the row where there's the issue that you have to clean up. And so I can skip those last records and then complete that import. The last change that we've made as part of XML import is the checking of mandatory fields. So in prior versions, the system wasn't checking that the minimum amount of information had been recorded on each record you were creating. That's a check that was only being done on the data entry screens. And the new version XML import checks for any fields that you've marked as being mandatory in Vernon, and it'll flag those records during the import. And you'll have the chance of either skipping that record or in some cases, you may be able to add the information during the import process to fix that record and continue. The next change we've made is adding more search options into Vernon. The downside of adding search fields in Vernon is that it increases the time that it takes to save a record. And so we've introduced a feature last year, which we've called optional indexes where you can control which individual fields in the system are being indexed for searching. And so that's going to impact on the saving time, but it means that you've got that field available in the advanced screen for searching within records in Verna. So optional indexes is a new screen that's available through system maintenance under the search tool submenu. And in this version, we've added new optional indexes on current condition keyword, classification date, and datum for geographic coordinates, both in the site and in the object file. This version includes a couple of minor date enhancements. There was already a keyword where you could do T for today as a shortcut in any date field, and then we've added a similar one where you can do Y for yesterday. So for example, if you were recording a location change that happened yesterday, you can just quickly type in Y as a shortcut into a date field to get it to fill in yesterday's date. We've also added a couple of extra date keywords, from and by. So you could mark that a particular object was created from 1935. There's a number of sundry bug fixes, which we've also introduced in this version. One of those is that previously on the reporting screen, when you were trying to find a field to add to the report, it would sometimes come up with an error saying no more results found, even though it found the display field you wanted to include. So that bug has been fixed. We've also fixed a bug where sometimes the copy from previous record menu option wasn't available, even though you just worked on a record and wanted to copy that to the next one. We found an issue where if you were working through a browse list in one field and just changing data in that field and moving forward through a whole set of records, that save wasn't always happening. That was only happening if you never left the field. So it was a pretty specific case, but we've been able to identify the cause and fix that. We've also found that accession numbers that didn't exactly match the image file names weren't always resulting in an image being correctly linked. So the image linking process now better matches the accession numbers in the system and hopefully results in more of your images connecting to the records when you bulk link them. We've changed how some of the screens within Vernon resize. If you're on a larger screen, you can stretch the corner of a window. And for instance, in the advanced search screen, We've now made it so that the bottom area of the screen is the area that resizes because that's where you're most likely to need more display space on a bigger monitor. The same is true for the field name override screen that now resizes 
to include more information on the columns that are most usable. We've also had some cases where clients want to have a mandatory number of decimal places in a particular measurement unit. So in the example I've got here, I've got a measurement that's in centimetres, and I've configured the system now to force the display of two decimal places. In previous versions of Vernon, if that was an exact number, it would just round that up and we'd just see 10 centimetres, not 10.00. So you now have a little bit more control over the formatting of those decimal numbers. There's a few other sundry enhancements. Firstly, you can now select multiple parts when adding an objects into a packing unit in the transport activity. We've added an extra security layer into Web Messenger, which is the process where Vernon sends raw data to another system, including Vernon Browser. So there's now an authentication layer to secure that connection. And then lastly, there's a new shortcut to easily reopen the previous record you were working on. That new menu option is just available through the file menu under last access record. And it has a keyboard shortcut as well. So you can just use control shift S to quickly bring back the last record you were working on. And as with all major releases, we always have an Easter egg in there. So some little hidden quirk or activity you can do. So I'll swap back to our system again. And this year's Easter egg is you can click in the status line down the bottom and you can type the word quiz and it'll come up with a short quiz, partly with Vernon history and partly with museum questions. And you can decide how good your knowledge is of Vernon CMS and Vernon systems. And that goes along with a number of other Easter eggs that we've had in previous versions where there's hidden keywords you can type into the status line. I'll just briefly cover some of the main things we've done with Vernon Browser in the version 6 series. The most significant change for end users is the introduction of a full online help website. So here's a sample page in there showing you how you can manage the color navigation within Vernon Browser. We've also been working on the scalability of the product. We've now got sites that have around a million records within Vernon Browser. And so the product's been expanding to cope with those larger volumes of information. We've also added in support for an unlimited number of object fields, as we've got some sites that are wanting to publish more than 100 fields, which was the previous limit. And then lastly, we've got better defaulting of old text for things like screen readers. So now automatically the product adds old text of the title of the object and the AI subject keywords, unless you've added a caption to that image specifically in Vernon. We've also been introducing a new monitoring service, which we're using behind the scenes. We previously had monitoring of all of our hosted Vernon browser sites but that was just on the level of whether those sites were running or not. We're now monitoring at a much more detailed level, monitoring things like memory and CPU usage, and then we're able to track problems before they become apparent on a public website. I'll briefly look at upcoming plans. So we'll be continuing with the minor releases, which are primarily aimed at bug fixes, but they can also fix minor enhancements at the same time as well. So one example of those is that the encoded archival descriptions standard is supported by Vernon as a way of outputting object records. There's a new version of that, and that's just an XML standard for us to comply to. So there's some small changes for us to make as part of the output that's coming out of Vernon to support that standard. The next major release, however, will be version 13, which has been codenamed Fantastic Fantail. The biggest part of the change for next year's release is upgrading the underlying database platform. We currently use Open Insight version 9, and that will be reaching the end of life next year. So it's critical that we upgrade to Open Insight version 10 so that we're able to continue getting things like security enhancements and patches for that underlying database and user interface designing product. 
Matthew and our team has already been working on that migration this year, and we're partway through that, and that will become the first focus for next year's major release. Once we've completed the migration to Open Insight 10, we can then look at other changes, so changes with more general enhancements to the interface and functionality of Vernon. However, that Open Insight 10 upgrade does give us some extras out of the box. Open Insight 10 runs faster, and it has better options for designing the user interface. So we're investigating how we can manage things like zooming in and out of windows to make use of the full amount of a desktop space that an individual person has. We've also been running a series of workshops online to discuss particular areas of the system where we could enhance them further. One of those sessions was looking at valuations, and out of that workshop, we can see that we need to add in better support for foreign currency. So recording foreign currency values and exchange rates as at the time of that valuation, and adding that information both to the object file and to the acquisition proposal file. We've got some sites that would like to record decimal value for valuations, so dollars and cents, for example, and that's another one of the areas that we need to enhance. Then lastly, we want to add support for reporting on particular valuation periods, so historic periods, and to do that without needing to change things in the system maintenance settings. So that's only possible at the moment by the system supervisor setting up a valuation period, and that's then hard-coded for all users. But sometimes one individual user would like to report on a historic valuation period, and we want to extend the reporting tool to allow for that. We also ran a workshop for library records that are catalogued within Vernon to see what areas needed attention. And so out of that, we've identified two new fields that we have to add to the object file. So separating out call number, which is currently managed just as an other ID field, and also adding in a publication series and notes table so that you can mark that a particular book is part of a larger overarching publication series. The only other minor change is for natural sciences. On the classification file, allowing people to record multiple conservation statuses that are specific perhaps to an area of geography rather than worldwide. At the moment, the thumbnail version that we have in Open Insight is quite small. So that's the one that we see in the identification screen. As part of the upgrade to Open Insight 10, we'll be looking to see whether we can change that thumbnail size to make that more visible on the larger screens that people are primarily using now. We also need to fully support links to images via web links as people start to use third-party systems like DAMs to store those source files. Then lastly, we've got more requests recently to bulk delete records. So we're seeing whether there's a way for us to provide that as a generic option in the system. It's currently only possible through system monitor to bulk delete records. For us, the last year has seen us gradually transitioning back to working in the office for the first time. It's been a very disrupted period over the last three years. So it's great to have at least some of us back in the office now. And the range of online access tools we've implemented has made it easier and easier to work when we're spread apart. So we're now using a mixture of tools like the Slack instant messaging, an instant telephone and video tool, and Zoom as a way of coordinating each other's work when we're spread out, and then occasionally working together in the office. We've also continued to gain new clients. We've got a couple of new ones in the works that we're just about to announce, but we've also had a couple that were already a long way through the implementation project. Those are Amazwi, which is the South African Museum of Literature, which is undergoing a huge data migration from their legacy system, and the Ipswich Transport Museum, which has a very similar diverse collection to our local Museum of Transport and Technology. I'd also like to introduce our new product owner for web. You've already seen Dave Sanderson in some of the sessions this week, 
and he's joined us to manage Vernon Browser and eHive. So his role as a product owner is helping coordinate all of the people that make that product a success. So all the way from the design, development, through to testing and documentation, and liaising with the clients that make use of those systems. Being a customer advocate, so that internally we're doing the best possible work to produce what our clients actually need for those products. I'll cover some of the online access work that we've done in the last year. So Vernon Browser continues to be implemented at new institutions and many sites look to upgrade to make use of the latest features that we add to that product. On the left, we can see a screenshot of Yahoo's Vernon Browser where they have some fantastic Im imagery of their Tonga Māori collection. On the right-hand side, we can see a list of the different New Zealand clients that have upgraded or implemented Vernon Browser for the first time. And then we've also been working on projects in other parts of the world, in Australia, the UK and the US. On the left, we've got Falkirk Museums. They bring together a number of different sites in Scotland, and they have a huge collection of tens of thousands of items currently available in Vernon Browser. And that covers both museum items and archives, library and photography collections. I'll just briefly cover the changes that we'll be making in Vernon Browser over the next year. Firstly, we need to streamline the process that we have for managing so many different hosted sites. We now have over 70 clients using Vernon Browser. And so just the day-to-day -day maintenance of those servers, rolling out security patches, rolling out minor updates to Vernon Browser itself becomes a large task. So we're implementing some of the industry's best tools for managing that process. And that allows us to automate some of those updates and to better manage the scalability of those sites as the volume of visitors on them increases. So as we saw for University of Melbourne, some of the sites are getting enormous numbers of visitors and the product needs to scale up to handle that. We've implemented support for high resolution images in eHive. So we're working through porting that functionality to Vernon Browser for sites that do want to selectively give access to high resolution images. It might be, for example, only the images where it's no copyright applying to it where you allow access to high resolution images. We're also meeting the demand for access to other files within Vernon CMS within the online interface. And so that covers access to the event records, site records and document records, which we've got many different specialized collections making use of. We also have more sites wanting to publish linked PDF files to the web where they've scanned more complex items such as books or articles, and they want those scanned versions to be available to read page by page online. We can currently publish PDFs, but it's a long-winded process. So we're looking at automating that process. I'll now show you some live examples of some of the online access projects we've worked on over this year. And I'll start off with Whakatane Museum. That's a museum where they engaged a translator and a lot of the elements within Vernon Browser are now available in both English and in Māori. So this is their live website and we can see, for instance, on the top menu, we've got the English and Māori terms. Because Vernon Browser has a responsive design, it fits the size of the screen that the user is using and it allows them to easily zoom in or out depending on their font size preferences. So for instance, I can easily just use Control Plus, which is the universal browser shortcut to zoom in and out and make all of that content larger. If I go into the Explore menu, we can again see that bilingual interface flowing through. And they've carried that forward through the whole interface for Vernon Browser. So all of the various headings that allow you to filter content, for example, they've engaged somebody to come up with correct translations for those terms. There's also been work done at the catalog level within Vernon to, in some cases, add translations for those records. And so that can be supported either through user-defined text fields 
or through having terms that have two possible translations, like object types. The next example I want to show you is the site that was referenced in Tessie Scott's talk. So within the University of Melbourne, there's a cluster of medical museums for the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Pathology. Because that's three different collecting institutions that historically were separate museums within the organization, we've made use of browser features to allow people to drill into just those specific collections. So if I wanted to jump into just the Medical History Museum collection, we've got a tile on the homepage to do that. The browser does support discrete collections like that, and it gives you options to configure how those individual collections are presented. And that goes down to features such as advanced search, where you can search across all of the collection items that are available online, or you could search just a specific collection and perhaps offer different search options just for one of those collections. So for instance, if I swap to Medical History Museum, we'll see that the search options on this page change accordingly because they've got slightly different catalog records than what the two other organizations have. So they've made use of different features within Vernon CMS and they want to showcase that to the best result within the Vernon browser website. Our local Museum of Transport and Technology is one of the first sites that's making use of online exhibitions within Vernon Browser. So that takes content that's been entered into the exhibition venue activity file and then presents that online, usually only presenting certain exhibitions, either the ones that are currently on show or the ones that are closed and not the ones that are only in a planning stage. So if I search for everything within their collection, we can see they've got 85,000 objects and currently there's 13 exhibitions that are available to view online. And I could drill down into any of those. So if I wanted to see information about Get Smart, which is a permanent exhibition, which is still on show, I can click into that and all of this information is being driven by data that's back in Vernon. So an overview of the exhibition, the dates that it ran for, and links to the collection objects, which are also online through Vernon Browser. The next example I wanted to show is for the Australian Racing Museum, which is covering horse racing within Australia. Part of their work has been scanning historic documents, including the turf registers, which document races going all the way back to the 1800s. They've made that one of their curated highlight sets within Vernon Browser. So they've manually picked the items that they want to group together and showcase on the website. And they've uploaded the PDF scans for those items. Those PDF scans are just linked in the external file field of the catalog record. And if that field is available for a record, then we just see that as part of the cataloging data. So they've just given that a field label of related information. And from that, I could click on it to access the high resolution PDF that they've uploaded for the item. Another key area of activity for the Australian Racing Museum is their Hall of Fame. That's a link right at the top of the homepage. And I'll click into that. An important part of the information they manage are all of the famous racehorses. There isn't a place built into Vernon by default to catalog details about racehorses, but we've done some clever customization to allow them to record those in the person database because a lot of the information they want to record is similar to an individual. They want to record biographical details, including birth and death dates, place of birth, they want to record activities that those horses have been involved in. They want to link them to collection items. And they want to relate them to other horses. So the parents of a particular racehorse may be noted. So we can see in the Hall of Fame a number of different famous horses. So I could click into Ajax, for example. And then all of this information is coming from a record in the person table. They've recorded images of the horses in some cases. They've recorded biographies. 
and detailed information about the races and winnings of that particular horse. If there are collection items which depict that particular horse, then they're linked at the bottom. So these are all collection items in the object file, which link back to Ajax, the racehorse. Lastly, I want to show how some sites are making use of online comments. So late last year, we launched a feature to have full comments moderation. That means that when somebody posts a comment on a collection item on your website, it isn't initially visible to other public users. It goes into an admin area within Vernon Browser, and you've got the opportunity to review that comment, approve it if it's okay, and publicly or privately reply to that comment. If I search for all of the collection items within here and drill into an individual item, there's always a link at the bottom page where we can see the comments across the whole site. So we can look and see what particular items are generating interest at the moment. That will show us the date of the comment. And we can see that even within the last week or two, there's been a number of new comments. If I click into them, we can see the kind of great information that's being returned back by the public to help the Maritime Museum improve their collection information. This is a typical photograph where all of the information they knew was just that it was a naval vessel and the port that it was docked at. However, interested people in the public have been able to look at that and perhaps through their heritage in the Navy, identify exactly which ship that is and give other further background information. So they've been able to identify what the name of the ship is and describe different features of that ship. And that can feed back into the information that's recorded in Vernon. So that's an example of the types of ways that people are using comments to gather more information about their collection and some examples of other recent Vernon browser projects. Now, unfortunately, one of the things which we'll be doing this year is changing our hourly and daily rates. Many of you will have seen the inflation rates around the world are currently very high. And for us, that directly affects many of our costs. The last time that we reviewed these prices were back in 2019. So it's three years since we last assessed these. These changes won't have a direct effect on most clients because our annual support charges and eHive subscriptions are remaining unchanged. So it's only affecting ad hoc work such as customization and browser web design projects. Those new prices are going to come into effect on the 1st of November. Another one of the big areas of work for us is technical communication. So at this point, I'm going to hand you over to Penny and she'll give an overview of some of the projects that we've worked on in that area. So this year we launched a new help website, Vernon Browser Help, and that's available by going to browser.vernonsystems.com. You scroll down, there's a link through to the help website. You can go directly there, help browser.vernonsystems.com and if you're a browser user there's a help link within the admin interface when you're logged in. So we have information here on setting up Vernon Browser and the different steps that we go through in order to do that including detailed information on how to prepare your data in Vernon CMS and we also have help for current users such as comments facility, how to set up comment moderation, and so on. So I encourage you to explore that website. Another big project that we've got for next year is Vernon CMS Help. So this is looking at improving help across the vcms-help.vernonsystems.com website, the information in the support portal, and understanding how people use information about how to use Vernon CMS. So we'll be looking at improving the navigation, the site structure, the search, the look and feel. And we need your help with this project as we want it to be user-centered. We want it to work for you. So we'll be in touch about how you can get involved with that. Every month we hold a webinar, which is free. So this is on the first Thursday of every month. 
we also produce a video of that and put it on YouTube so that you can re-watch that or share it with people who weren't able to attend. Please send us your suggestions for next year, including if you want to present about something. So we're really keen for it to be a forum for people to be able to share the work that they're doing and sharing tips and techniques as well. So the last one for this year is on the 3rd of November. It's an accessibility webinar and it will be covering some of the things that we touched on this week. Lastly, just a reminder about our Burn and CMS online course. Lots of people are taking the online course and so just get in touch with us if you or your staff want to join in on that and I will help you with that. Thank you. And then at that point, I'd just thank everybody for attending this week. I hope you all got something useful out of it. It's been a pleasure hosting this for everybody this week. And then I'd love to see you again next year for the next annual event. Bye for now.